In the southern part of continental China, this small piece of land can be found. This territory, consisting of several islands and a peninsula, may seem insignificant at first. However, don't be fooled by its size, because this territory houses the third largest population of billionaires and the absolute largest concentration of ultra high net worth individuals of any place in the world. Its financial significance rivals that of New York City, Beijing and London, and is one of the most important economic capitals of Asia. The name of the territory, Hong Kong. But surprisingly, even with its geographical connection to mainland China and its incredible financial power, it isn't technically controlled by China. Yet. So why is this, and what will the consequences be when this inevitably happens in the future? Well, Hong Kong's current situation can be traced all the way back to the mid-1800s, when the British Empire first laid its hands on this piece of land. Back then, Great Britain had claimed Hong Kong as a spoil of war following the First Opium War in 1841. This war was fought on grounds of British merchants growing and distributing incredible quantities of opium to the Chinese people in an attempt to circumvent the growing trade imbalance between the British Empire and the Chinese Qing Dynasty. Far East luxury goods such as silk, tea and porcelain were in high demand in the West. But as English silver began to dry up, which was the only payment method the Chinese accepted, the Brits had to find a solution. So the British traders and merchants got large numbers of the Chinese population addicted to opium which instantly created an incredible demand for this goods and, more importantly, immense market power for the Brits. But eventually, the Qing dynasty caught on to this, as they had a growing population addicted to opium. So they declared war on the British Empire. To make a long story short, the British Empire won and Hong Kong ceded to Britain. It stayed this way throughout most of the 18th and 19th century, except for a brief Japanese occupation during World War II from 1941 to 1945. But all this changed in 1997. After ruling and developing Hong Kong over the course of 156 years, Great Britain finally agreed to transfer the territory back to China. In this agreement, Hong Kong would be allowed to continue their western way of governing for an additional 50 years into the future, after which it would entirely be transferred to the Chinese government in 2047. This meant that a so-called one country, two systems policy was implemented in Hong Kong, where the territory would govern itself under its own system separate from China. This is where we run into our first issue. You see, China is an authoritarian socialist republic run by a single political party named the Chinese Communist Party, or the CCP in short. Hong Kong, on the other hand, has developed and evolved alongside Great Britain into something completely different, during its more than one and a half century long period as a British colony. Essentially, the previous Western form of rule means that this territory is now a capitalist service economy full of democratic institutions, and that makes Hong Kong's transfer from British to Chinese hands in 2047 a rather awkward affair. Because if there are two things in this world that cannot be further from each other, it is communism and capitalism. The same thing goes for China's version of a republic and a democracy. Unsurprisingly though, the Chinese government wishes to convert the current Hong Kong government into something that matches the CCP's rule, way before the aforementioned expiration date in 2047. And as you know, this would be completely against the rules of the 97 agreement, which might sound like odd behavior when looking at this from an outside perspective, as the western way of governing had proven extremely effective in Hong Kong ever since the place was colonized. I mean, back in the 18th century, the territory was a very rural district with only a small population of local fishermen and farmers. But due to the capitalistic system that was implemented by the Brits, it has now turned into Asia's financial capital with unimaginable hordes of wealth. Today, the city houses more than 7.5 million people of all nationalities, making it one of the most densely populated places in the world, while also being the ninth largest importer and exporter of goods. 
To put this immense market power into perspective, Hong Kong's incredible export is bigger than that of Norway, Sweden and Austria combined, at approximately 649 billion US dollars annually. So maybe it's no wonder China wishes to get its hands on this territory as soon as possible. And understandably, this has been and is getting increasingly concerning to the citizens of Hong Kong who have begun taking action in the form of protests. Recently, the Chinese government has proposed and implemented laws in Hong Kong that haven't been conducted democratically, which strictly goes against the agreement they have with Britain. To make matters worse, very few outside countries have been actively trying to help. That includes the very country the agreement has been made with, Great Britain. So the people of Hong Kong have been taking matters into their own hands. As a result of this, in 2019, citizens of Hong Kong began protesting in the streets due to the increasing intervention from the Chinese government. The intervention was directly interfering with the high degree of autonomy promised by China in the 97 agreement and was cause for concern for the Hong Kong citizens. So what was this intervention exactly? Well, to be specific, the government had proposed a law that meant that the court system of mainland China would be able to influence any trials in Hong Kong, as well as enable extraditions of any potential criminals. This was concerning for Hong Kong citizens, since China isn't exactly known for having fair and unbiased criminal trials. Even worse is the fact that this would create an opening for the Chinese government to arrest and punish any political dissidents in Hong Kong, significantly harming the freedom of speech within the city. Throughout the early months of 2019, small demonstrations arose in Hong Kong opposing this bill. But on the 9th of June, Hong Kong citizens had enough. An estimated 1 million protesters took to the streets to voice their disagreements about the proposed changes. This was met by around 240,000 police officers and hell broke loose. Police used excessive force on the protesters using terror gas on the masses and brutally beating individuals. But no less than a week later, on the 16th of June, a new demonstration took place. This time, participation had doubled. An estimated 2 million protesters were walking the streets clad in black clothes and wearing masks and helmets to protect their identities. The police force had also increased their numbers to an estimated 338,000 officers and chaos ensued. Due to the protests being met by police brutality, the protesters themselves began retaliating. This created a vicious circle, which led to more police brutality and even the implementation of anti-riot police and a special tactical squad, which were responsible for the worst violence. Many citizens were arrested during the protests and a sample drawn by Amnesty International revealed that 85% of the arrested people were hospitalized following severe beatings by the police while in custody. Some protesters even lost their lives fighting for the freedom of their city. In the end, the extradition bill that originally led to the demonstrations was withdrawn. But unfortunately, this did not solve the problem. You see, the size of the demonstration, which included over one-fourth of Hong Kong's entire population, put a virtual stop to the city's economy for a short while. This created a very tough dilemma for the people of Hong Kong. The reasoning behind this is that the main selling point of Hong Kong is its economic value and status as an essential reliable financial hub for the world's mega corporations. And it's this status that may end up as the savior of the city when the year 2047 comes. If Hong Kong is capable of showing that the previously mentioned one country, two systems policy will remain, that implements capitalism and democratic solutions. This would likely keep the financial wheels of the city spinning and it may convince the Chinese Communist Party to maintain the system or at least loosen its grip on the territory politically. In contrast, if the current Western form of government doesn't work, say due to protests and economic instability, there is no use in keeping it at all. 
This fact puts the protesters in a dire situation, because no matter what the residents of Hong Kong do, the outcome may unfortunately be undesirable for them. Some protesters have even expressed uncertainty regarding the effectiveness of the demonstrations and whether they will actually help prevent mainland China from taking control over Hong Kong and keep them from radically changing its laws over the long term. But most Hong Kongers believe fighting and standing up for their rights is better than succumbing to the injustice the CCP has brought them. And this belief has had its effects on Hong Kong's economy both during and after the protests. In fact, the territory slipped into an economic recession for the first time in a decade in the second and third quarters of 2019 following the protests. Overall spending declined and sales decreased drastically. Tourism fell by 40% when compared to the previous year and unemployment increased from just 0.1% to 3.2% over the span of just three months. But perhaps most disastrous is the effect the demonstrations have had on Hong Kong property. You see, real estate is one of the city's main economic drivers and it has taken a huge hit in the period following the disturbances. The lucrative business of land premiums has accounted for almost a quarter of Hong Kong's revenue in the fiscal year of 2019 to 2020. This corresponds to an enormous 141.7 billion Hong Kong dollars, showing just how vital a a source of income this really is. But the reason for real estate accounting for such a large portion of Hong Kong's revenue is because the land is highly sought after for foreign and Chinese investors, which is by design, as Hong Kong significantly limits the amount of land they sell for leases. The problem here is that this incentivizes the foreign investors to prioritize building high-end luxury apartments instead of affordable housing for the average citizen. This creates a conflict of interest for the Hong Kong government, which has to house tens of thousands of new immigrants each year, while simultaneously preserving as much land as possible to sell to ultra-wealthy property investors in the future. Unfortunately, this has resulted in an unpleasant reality, as proper housing has become unaffordable for many of Hong Kong citizens. A lot of people are forced to live in so-called cage homes, these are tiny nano flats that only have room for a single bed that houses no more than one person. As you can see, there's room for nothing but the absolute necessities, and a depressingly large number of Hong Kong's people live under these conditions in huge ghetto blocks. Today, out of the 7.5 million residents of the city, an estimated 110,000 residents live in these cage homes. But these aren't the only consequences Hong Kong may face in the future. Due to the political and economic uncertainties, many foreign companies are considering moving their firms to other Asian financial capitals, such as Singapore and Tokyo. If this becomes a reality, it will cripple the economic significance of Hong Kong substantially. Chances are, many reforms such as the light regulation and the low tax rate in Hong Kong will be changed drastically to better reflect the current Chinese system. In reality, it seems like a dire lose-lose situation for the Hong Kong residents. But in a time where political and economic uncertainty is increasingly becoming a part of everyday life for Hong Kongers, the citizens stand up for their rights and do their best to defeat injustice. But that's it for this video. If you liked it, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel down below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.